ones. We've uh, had one just last week, I guess, on um, the death of bin Laden. And what we're trying to do at the school is leave room for more of these up-to-the-minute events that uh, are a little less planned um, and a little more reactive to what's going on in our news. But of course, it depends on very, very flexible faculty members to do this. And so we really appreciate um, Ambassador Kurtzer being here. For those of you who don't know Ambassador Kurtzer, and probably there's very few, uh, Ambassador Kurtzer is a faculty member here at the Woodrow Wilson School, but previously was an ambassador to both Egypt and Israel, those we say not at the same time, and um, just spent a week in Egypt. So really, this is a briefing to let us know what's going on over there, and so we really um, welcome him today. And I just want to acknowledge Congressman Holt, who was very gracious to come by and hear us, so thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I too want to say it's an honor that uh, our Congressman Rush Holt is here. Thank you for coming. Um, what I want to do today is really two things. Uh, as Elizabeth suggested, uh, first to uh, give a little briefing on a week that I spent in Cairo, uh, both in terms of describing the current situation and maybe suggesting ways in which the revolution is unfolding. And then in a really up to minute comment, uh, maybe to talk just for a few moments at the end about the President's speech earlier today and uh, how that might be received in Egypt based on conversations that I had. Uh, I went to Egypt as a member of the board of the American University. Uh, that was a good uh, platform on which to go, but uh, was able also to meet with a number of current and former government officials as well as members of the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, generals with whom I had worked uh, closely as ambassador and uh, therefore was able to have uh, a really good conversation about the role of the military in uh, the current transition to democracy and the evolution of the Egyptian uh, politics. Um, the, the situation as you uh, gather from the press and as you would imagine is very dynamic and very fluid and changes every day and the amount of information we have about it is uh, rather limited so that uh, even in Egypt, uh, one is left mostly with impressions, uh, impressions about uh, events that are largely being decided behind closed doors, and events and decisions that are being taken behind closed doors in which uh, there are complaints that there's not enough transparency to the decision-making process or consultation. Now, the people complaining are obviously those who are not being brought into the consultation process, uh, but there's a kind of general sense that the generals are taking decisions uh, rather, in some cases, I don't want to use the word haphazardly, but uh, without as much consultation as they might have engaged in a more uh, well-constructed uh, process. So uh, any picture, any snapshot of this situation is uh, going to be open to some criticism because by the time you develop the picture, uh, the situation would have changed. So with that caveat, let me suggest uh, there are four kind of categories in which I would uh, uh, give this briefing about Egypt. The first, uh, one has to start with the uh, security situation on the ground and the challenges of law and order in uh, uh, Cairo and particularly outside of Cairo. As you know, uh, during the uh, 18 days of the, uh, what's called the January 25th Revolution, uh, the police uh, came under tremendous criticism for their action, particularly uh, the police associated with state security, and uh, many of them simply went home. Uh, they went home with weapons, which uh, is a different issue we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and uh, there was a period of time of uh, very significant absence of police on the streets of uh, major cities and on the highways. In fact, some weeks ago, we were getting reports <clears throat> from Egypt of uh, brigandry on the Cairo Alexandria Road, kind of outlaws who were stopping cars and robbing people. But in addition to crime, uh, there's also the problem that uh, during the uprising and even afterwards, police stations uh, were attacked, uh, guns were taken, and uh, prisons were attacked and prisoners were released. So there's a mixture of people out on, these, on the uh, streets of Egypt, uh, criminals, 
who now find you know there's an absence of law enforcement. Uh, uh, released prisoners uh, who were imprisoned because of activities uh, that were uh, associated with crime or with political crimes. And there's also what um, people were calling thugs, which was a way of uh, suggesting that there may be uh, an effort on the part of uh, some people associated with the old regime to create a little bit of chaos in order to perhaps insinuate themselves back into the, uh, into the political fray. Uh, it's hard to get evidence of that, and one only hears uh, anecdotes about uh, the thuggery, but uh, a lot of people talk about it, and it becomes part of this security and law and order uh, issue. Uh, in this context, uh, there has also been an uptick in sectarian violence. Now, in Egypt, as, as you know, and as we've talked about from this podium uh, before, uh, sectarian uh, violence uh, between Muslims and Coptic Christians in Egypt is not a new phenomenon. It's uh, not necessarily a, a pervasive problem, but it's a problem that persists, uh, particularly in uh, some of the uh, uh, areas outside of Cairo where um, the regime's reach was uh, perhaps less, uh, less grounded. Uh, in the past several weeks, there have been two particularly uh, challenging events. One was pressure uh, put on the uh, Coptic governor of uh, Kina, a province, one of the provinces in Egypt, uh, by uh, what were described as members of the Salafi Muslim movement. Now, here's a side note uh, for a moment. Uh, we've known in Egypt that there have been fundamentalists over the years, usually associated with the Muslim Brotherhood or even some of the more uh, radical organizations. But this uh, presence in Egypt today of Salafis is puzzling to everybody. Uh, where whoever you talk to in Egypt says, where were they? Where did they come from? And all of a sudden they're there. Now the military says that the issue is exaggerated. There may be a couple of hundred, maybe a thousand, a couple of thousand, but these are individuals who largely were kind of underground over the years and have now emerged in this environment of greater freedom. But it's uh, likely that it was they who put the pressure on the governor of Kina and a crisis ensued in that governorate. And then of course, about two weeks ago, there was a, a very significant outbreak of violence in a very populated neighborhood in Cairo called Imbaba. Uh, for those who may remember, Imbaba was the place in which uh, there was an Islamic uprising in the early 1990s. And uh, for a while, in fact, the uh, Islamic movement in Egypt took over the neighborhood. And it was only cleared out uh, when the army and the police were sent in and a lot of uh, people were killed during the uh, that uh, abortive uprising. Uh, Mbaba then was also the place about two weeks ago where um, a classic Egyptian uh, problem ensued of a young woman, a Muslim, uh, a, a Christian woman who converted to Islam, um, was uh, uh, believed by the Muslims to be under pressure to reconvert to Christianity. Uh, rumors began spreading of her being held against her will, and uh, one thing led to the other, and uh, a couple of score of people um, were both injured and killed in a clash, uh, Muslims and Christians. So in addition to the uh, criminal activity, in addition to the possibility of some uh, anti-regime activity, in addition to the thuggery, you also have the rise of, um, of the sectarian violence. Now, in this context, it's not surprising that uh, conspiracy theories have emerged. And during the week in Cairo, uh, I heard more of them in that concentrated period than I had heard ever before. Uh, one theory has it that the military is in cahoots with the Muslim Brotherhood. The military scoffs at this and says, absolutely not. Another suggests that uh, perhaps the military and the government want the Salafis to create some havoc so that they can crack down. Uh, another theory suggests that, uh, and we heard this actually from <clears throat> one of the uh, representatives of the Coalition of the Revolutionary Youth. This is a group that's <clears throat> trying to coalesce, uh, and bring together uh, various uh, youth groups uh, who participated in the uprising. Uh, this representative at an AUC forum suggested that in fact the counter-revolution is being directed 
from Torah prison, which is one of the main prisons right outside of Cairo. Uh, but you hear these conspiracy theories because people are confused about uh, the uh, challenges to law and order and not quite understanding what is happening. The, uh, the military, uh, at the, as the, my visit ended, the military told me that they are well aware that uh, security is uh, perhaps the, most, the single most important and immediate issue that they have to restore. Because without it, um, no progress will be made um, in uh, a political transition, and it will be very challenging to get anybody to do anything economically, both uh, domestic investment and foreign investment. Military has diverted uh, some of their own uh, incoming personnel, in other words, recruits, uh, to the police. They've transferred some equipment to the police and believe that the situation is uh, getting better. The second issue to talk about is the debate underway about the timing and direction of what might be called the political roadmap. Uh, the really interesting, uh, fascinating, and good news about Egypt is that there is, in some respects, a town hall democracy quality to what's happening, at least among uh, the what you might call the activists of Tahrir and those from the old system who have managed to uh, remain engaged. Uh, meetings happening all the time uh, where people are able to speak their piece, <clears throat> lots of efforts to organize politics uh, and to uh, figure out not only how to form a political party, but also to disseminate ideas, to have, have a platform and uh, create an infrastructure which will uh, uh, exist throughout the country, not just in the, the main cities. Uh, as this is taking place, though, there is also a major uh, fissure that's developing between uh, those who want to see a very quick transition to uh, a parliamentary election, to have a parliamentary election and have a quick transition in which the military then returns to barracks, as opposed to those who argue that it's going too fast and not providing enough time and not enough proper content for the right kind of political transition to take place. Uh, Mohammed al-Baradai, for example, who uh, will be a presidential candidate and has remained uh, quite popular among uh, the uh, youth uh, who were involved in the, uh, the January-February uprising, has made the argument quite strongly that uh, the process that is underway today is backwards. That rather than have an election in September for a parliament and then, that, and then have that parliament develop a constitution in which uh, a decision will be made about the kind of system that will be in place in which there then will be a presidential election, El Baradai argues that there should be a constitutional convention uh, which would take some months the election to parliament should therefore be delayed. Uh, once the system of government is decided, then it would be right and proper to have the election for the parliament of that system and for the president, which with whatever powers and responsibilities are assigned under the constitution. Uh, one of the reasons for this, of course, is that Obarodai wants more time to organize, but he also wants the time and his followers want the time to uh, see the military go back to its barracks even before the elections and uh, have it replaced by what they call a presidential council. This argument uh, has great resonance among um, what might be called the Tahrir Square crowd. <coughs> excuse me, but as, excuse me one second. But as the military is quick to point out, the Tahrir Square crowd lost the constitutional referendum by an overwhelming vote of some 76 or 77 percent to 23, 24 percent. And that constitutional referendum was also, in a sense, a referendum on this roadmap for and timetable for change. So when I raised this issue with the military last Sunday, they said, should we follow the wishes of those who lost the referendum? Or should we follow the wishes of three quarters of the population who want to see the process proceed in this manner? As it is, the military pointed out, they have delayed the election originally scheduled for June until September, because June would have been 
uh, too soon, even in their own calculation, <clears throat> but they don't see the need to cater to the desires of uh, essentially a minority element within the population. And it was quite interesting to have this conversation because the military, in a sense, is appealing to majoritarian uh, rule and saying, you know, what do you want from us? We're just following the will of the people. Uh, but it is a, an issue that continues to uh, resonate within the society, uh, largely because the opposition is having trouble getting organized and having trouble raising money and having trouble doing the kinds of things that need to get done between now and September for them to uh, affirmatively contest um, the election. Uh, in this uh, context of the political roadmap, one of the key questions is how well uh, different groups will do. And here you have uh, projections that uh, really go all over the political map. Uh, there are some who suggest that because of this uh, tight timetable, the Muslim Brotherhood will do very well. Already the Brotherhood, which initially said that it would contest 35% of the parliamentary seats, now says that it will contest 50% of those seats, and the Salafis have announced that they're not bound by the Muslim Brotherhood's numbers, and they plan to contest even more of the seats, which raises the prospect in some people's minds that you may have a Muslim Brotherhood Islamist majority within the parliament. The uh, uh, military uh, poo-poos this and believes that that's an exaggeration. They also believe that the so-called Salafi threat is an exaggeration and believe that the Brotherhood's appeal in Egypt, which was uh, rather strong emotionally when the Brotherhood was an opposition element, will be reduced to its proper size now that the Brotherhood is just another party or another political faction or movement competing for uh, space uh, within the political environment. I guess we'll find out, uh, but it's, it's an issue that is uh, very much tied in with this debate over uh, the roadmap and the timetable. The third of the four issues that I, I want to brief on might be labeled the due process and the rule of law. Uh, already some 65,000 complaints, largely driven by citizens and the press, have been uh, deposited with the prosecutor general in Egypt related to corruption and uh, violence undertaken by the uh, Mubarak government. Um, the Prosecutor General has issued 2,200 orders to freeze the assets of families. And I underline families because the actual number of accounts frozen is probably three or four times the number 2,200 because they will freeze not only the principal's assets but also children and brothers and sisters and so forth. Uh, and this has led to a, a rather, uh, has had rather chilling effect uh, within the society. On the one hand, <clears throat> there is a, a general sense of the need to deal with the corruption and mismanagement and regime perpetrated violence of the past. And on the other hand, there's a sense growing that perhaps this is a witch hunt and that there is no stopping that witch hunt as it, uh, it grows ever larger. Uh, some of the most prominent uh, Egyptians, both from the business community and from the previous government, have in fact left the country and uh, are living in exile because they feel they cannot get a, a fair trial in Egypt. Uh, some people from that, those same communities are in jail and others uh, from those communities are uh, fearful that there's a knock on the door at midnight and they'll be next in line. Uh, this has led, as I'm going to indicate later, to very significant capital flight. Um, in addition to the uh, diminishing levels of Egyptian foreign currency as a result of uh, a long period in which the economy wasn't functioning, uh, the estimate is that over a billion dollars was sent out of the country by people who were afraid <clears throat> that their accounts were going to be sequestered and their assets uh, frozen. Um, the, uh, in addition to the, this process which is taking place uh, nominally through the legal system, there have also been uh, almost daily demonstrations and protests uh, throughout the country in various factories and economic sectors. The particular targets usually are the industries where privatizations took place. 
because the assumption is that in the process of those privatizations is where people found ways to be corrupt. Uh, they either got the, the goods for less than their market price or they shared some of the benefits of the privatization with government officials. Uh, you know, a thousand ways in which one can play the game. And so in many of those uh, uh, industries where there were privatizations, in the last eight years in Egypt saw a very significant number of privatizations consistent with demands of the World Bank, IMF, and donors. Uh, workers have been demonstrating, uh, in addition to putting complaints forward to the prosecutor general, they've been demonstrating for higher wages and better working conditions. Now, this is not unusual in societies. That's what workers do. They want more money. But when the factories aren't producing and the economy is not working, it's hard to figure out where that money is going to come from. And therefore, this too has become a drain uh, on, the, uh, on the economy. Uh, the, the problem uh, which kind of ties these issues together under the rule of law rubric is that there is a pervasive feeling that at least today one cannot get a fair trial, uh, largely because of the pressure of the masses. There's one reported case, could be true or not true, but it's a reported case where a courtroom was uh, uh, overrun by people angry at the judge's verdict, and that, of course, would have an impact on the next verdict of that judge or uh, other judges uh, who might want to rule in favor of a defendant who is unpopular with the crowds. Uh, we raised in a, in a session that we had at AUC, um, the question was raised with some of the uh, younger <coughs> participants as to whether or not, uh, rather than uh, proceed along this path of what some are calling a witch hunt, perhaps it may be better to think about a truth and reconciliation process as took place in South Africa. But uh, the, uh, the young woman who answered the, uh, the question basically said, first we want the truth and then we can think about reconciliation. The key is accountability, which uh, the Egyptian people feel they've never had before. So this set of issues related to due process and the rule of law are um, midstream and uh, it's hard to know uh, how it's going to play out. Uh, and that impacts on the fourth issue that I wanted to, to brief on, and that's uh, the impact on the economy. Uh, as much of a revolution as this has been so far uh, with regard to the authoritarian rule of the Mubarak regime and political change, it was also a revolution which had as its, at its foundation uh, growing anger over the maldistribution of wealth, the growing gap between rich and poor, uh, and to corruption. And so the economic success of the revolution is going to go a long way in determining uh, the overall success of the revolution. And right now the picture is pretty gloomy, uh, but this is a short-term uh, analysis. Uh, we've only had three months to look at it. The uh, projections uh, earlier this year for Egypt before the revolution were for 5.5% annual growth. The government has downsized that projection to 2.5%, and everybody laughs at that because the assumption is that there will be negative growth uh, by the end of the year. As I mentioned earlier, foreign currency reserves uh, have dropped precipitously. Uh, the estimate is that of the about $36 billion in reserves that Egypt had before the revolution, there is probably less than $30 billion, which is an amazing uh, drop uh, in that uh, statistic. One billion of which, as I noted, uh, was uh, a capital outflow by individuals uh, seeking to protect their, uh, their money. Uh, on two days in January, the first, actually the second and third day of the uprising, the Egyptian stock market lost 70 billion pounds, which is about $10 billion worth of uh, market capitalization, has not yet recovered. Tourism is estimated at losing $40 million a day uh, in uh, lost revenues. Um, and local and foreign investment have essentially dried up, uh, both because of uncertainties related to the political situation, but also uncertainties related to what investors always look at. Is this a place where we can invest with the possibility of getting 
of having recourse to the courts should things uh, go wrong. So up until now, in these first three or four months, in this critical area, which will largely determine success of the overall revolutionary venture, um, we are still on the downswing. Um, one can project that it will uh, upswing at some point, but I'm not sure that we're, we're there yet. And there's also, in this context, uh, rather inflated expectations about what others will do. Um, there was, uh, people talked about uh, elderly women sitting in Tahrir Square waiting for uh, a check for $25,000, which they think will come their way out of the proceeds of the money recovered from Mubarak's corruption. They're just waiting for their, their uh, due date of uh, the delivery of this money, uh, which is, of course, not going to happen. Um, but there's also an expectation among uh, people in the know that the international community will come to Egypt's help and provide the safety net <clears throat> in terms of uh, lost revenues and investment that uh, Egypt is experiencing now. And these expectations, in fact, may be highly inflated, which uh, contributes uh, to the problem. So far, uh, I discerned no uh, indication that the privatizations will be reversed, but there's already some murmuring about it. Um, but I would note that that murmuring is in the community of those who benefited from privatization. So they're obviously nervous about their own position and fearful that uh, what they've worked on for the last uh, 10 to 15 years is going, is going to be uh, reversed. Uh, a couple of comments on what I would call social implications, and then I'll talk uh, for a moment about the president's speech and what that might mean, particularly with respect to Egypt. Um, first, as I noted, uh, the sectarian issue is extraordinarily important and it's, I think, uh, extraordinarily challenging right now. Uh, we were there last Friday for a large sectarian, or I should say a unity rally for sectarian uh, comity. Uh, and there are a lot of these evidences of Muslims and cops trying to figure out how to push back against the radicals within their respective communities. We saw it during the Tahrir uprising where during Muslim prayers the cops would form a protective circle and during Christian prayers the Muslims would form a protective circle. Uh, and this, this activity is continuing to take place but uh, as you move outside of the big cities uh, and I don't have the personal experience this past week to tell you that I saw this or could feel it, <clears throat> but you hear anecdotally that that level of uh, sectarian unity doesn't quite exist outside of uh, Cairo and even not in Alexandria where there have been some challenging issues. Um, second, uh, some of the younger uh, people that we talked to uh, expressed concern about what they called the temporary uh, unity of purpose. Uh, I mean, they're quite thrilled that people came together in Tahrir and there was a sense of uh, unity in the idea of getting rid of Mubarak. But in one respect, as soon as Mubarak left office, uh, everybody had an entirely different idea of what to do next. Some were happy that the military took over and hoped for stability and the military would just kind of return things to normal. Others wanted to see the military totally out of politics. So there is there is concern about, um, I, I don't want to exaggerate, but one could make the argument perhaps that the revolution achieved its initial purpose too soon because the those involved in Tahrir never had a chance to formulate a post-Tahrir agenda. And so Mubarak leaves office and then everybody looks around and says, now what do we do? Uh, and this, um, has led some sociologists at the universities to suggest that there will also be a, what they call a reinvention of social norms, uh, just how Egyptians relate to each other and basic values and uh, activities within society. It may be overdrawn, and I'm, I'm not sure that uh, it, it's wise to spend a lot of time on that now, but it, it underscores this idea that uh, there's a great deal of uncertainty about the direction of change as well as the pace of change. 
In some aspects or some uh, parts of the society, there is a growing nostalgia for at least the stability that the Mubarak regime brought to Egyptians. Uh, you don't hear anybody, it's not polite to say nice words about Mubarak, so you don't hear anybody say, gee, it would be good to have Mubarak back. But a lot of people in the business community will tell you that at least there was stability. You know, that part of the social contract between government and people was quite important. Don't know what impact that has over time. If law and order and security are restored relatively soon, then this um, growing nostalgia for um, stability may in fact dissipate. Um, and I think the last question I would raise is um, both whether and if so when there will be something that we would call a counter-revolution. Uh, for those who study revolutions, they always, counter-revolutions always happen. And it's hard to project that the Egyptian experience will be different. Uh, right now, we don't have a sense of what form it might take. The army being uh, in this role of the Supreme Council may in fact um, mitigate the effects of a counter-revolution or may tamp it down entirely. And this may be a case study in the future that we look back and say, if you want to avoid a counter-revolution, have the military play this overriding role. But uh, at least for those who have looked at past revolutions, one has to wonder whether or not all those unhappy people who benefited from the previous regime uh, state security and the police on the one hand and a large segment of a very successful business community will be happy being relegated to the sidelines and uh, ostracized for their previous activities and what will that mean if there is a counter-revolution? Can it take place within the new system or would it actually involve uh, violence? Um, and one doesn't know. In fact this may be a question that never gets raised, but uh, at least in terms of revolutionary theory. The uh, late Charles Isawi, who taught here for many, many years, uh, said in his book, uh, Isawi's Laws of Social Motion, reminded us that revolutions revolve 360 degrees. And uh, we're, we're not at that point in this revolution. So it's an interesting uh, issue to watch. Implications for U.S. policy, and that gets us uh, to the last point I'd want to uh, note formally, um, and that's uh, covered in uh, President Obama's speech today, which is going to be analyzed for quite some time. Uh, first of all, the President uh, answered the question, which I think uh, was on people's minds, would there be a <clears throat> unambiguous uh, U.S. position in favor of this change in the region? And the President, I think, left no doubt that uh, we are going to side with the forces of change, democratization, and he specified uh, quite uh, clearly uh, what he meant, uh, universal <coughs> norms and universal rights relating to uh, assembly, speech, religion, association, as well as women's rights and human rights. Um, this will uh, sound very positive in the region uh, because uh, the a kind of uh, care or carefulness with which the administration approached the uprising uh, raised questions in Egypt as to whether or not the administration really wanted to see the revolution succeed or whether or not we were going to be happy with something far short of a democratic process. The president seemed to have answered that today uh, in his speech. Secondly, there, as part of the expectations I mentioned about uh, what the outside world was going to do or could do economically, uh, the President noted a variety of uh, um, initiatives, uh, some of which will require uh, congressional uh, action, some of which can be done by kind of um, changing programs already existing, including uh, trade and investment uh, initiatives, uh, debt relief, uh, and so forth. Uh, I think as the dust settles from the speech, uh, this is going to be the one area that will be most carefully scrutinized. Uh, the Egyptians know us um, as well as we know them, which means imperfectly, but we've dealt with each other now for 30 years closely, and they're going to look to see whether or not the president was talking about what I guess we would call new money, or whether he was talking about shuffling around existing money. Uh, 
And there is some evidence to suggest that um, there is no new money to be uh, injected into this process, which means that a variety of means would have to be undertaken. For example, using the Egyptian aid pipeline as a means of paying the scoring and other costs associated with debt relief. And so Egypt, in a sense, pays for its own debt relief. Now, if they really get debt relief out of it, it's not a bad deal. But there will be pushback from the Egyptians who will say, the money in the pipeline is ours. It just hasn't been delivered yet. Why have we not been consulted when you have made this announcement about debt relief that you want to use our money to pay for the costs associated with debt relief? These are very Washington-centric, obtuse arguments. But as I said, the Egyptians know these issues because this is what we do every day in our AID and Egyptian consultations. And, uh, you know, as I say, after the dust settles from the speech, uh, the uh, accountants on both sides are going to sit down and try to figure out whether or not uh, Egypt will say that the United States was really responsive to their financial and economic uh, requirements. Uh, last point which the president covered in, uh, at the end of his speech, which is uh, the uh, reactivation of the Middle East peace process. For the first time in the 30 years that I have either lived in or visited or been associated with things Egyptian, uh, almost nobody talked about the Middle East peace process. Uh, in fact, the only extended discussion that I had was with the foreign minister whose job it is to talk about the Middle East peace process. But uh, Egyptians with whom I, who, whom I had known over the years who only wanted to complain about America's attitude towards Palestinians and in favor of Israel were very self-absorbed. So there wasn't a lot of popular discussion about the peace process. But when the issue did come up, there was this, again, inflated expectation that the president was going to fix it. He was going to come out with an American plan and it was going to do what he said that he wanted to do when he entered office, and that there's going to be a big um, initiative. Now, what the president actually did was to advance our policy uh, from where it was uh, this morning. Uh, we are now a little bit further down the road with respect to defining the borders of a Palestinian state. <clears throat> if you recall, two years ago, Secretary of State Clinton said that America's interest was to um, try to, uh, I forget the word she used, but it was to try to uh, uh, deal with the Palestinian insistence on using the June 67 boundaries as the uh, marker for their state boundaries with Israel's requirement of secure and recognized boundaries. This was a, a kind of interesting formulation that didn't quite associate us with the June 67 lines. The president today now got rid of the ambiguity and he said it's American policy that, <coughs> excuse me, that the, border, the borders of Israel and Palestine should be defined by the June 1967 lines with a mutually agreed swaps of territory. So in the arcane world of diplomacy, uh, this is an advance. This is a stronger articulation of an American position. What we don't know yet is whether or not it will be enough to attract the Israelis and Palestinians to uh, negotiate rather than to go off and do unilateral things. The president, as you also heard, spoke very harshly against Hamas, does not like the reconciliation agreement, and spoke very negatively about the prospect of unilateral Palestinian independence in September. And so clearly what the president's hoping is that he has opened a door for negotiations which will preempt these unilateral moves. Um, before we have a chance to really analyze this, there's going to be a meeting tomorrow between the president and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel. The early indications are is that the Israelis are very unhappy with the president's formulation because they don't want the United States policy to be associated with a particular a definition of the boundary. Uh, and in the great world of diplomacy, particularly Arab-Israeli diplomacy, the unhappier Netanyahu is with that formulation, the happier the Palestinians may be. So you may end up, as a result of this visit, the president's going to speak at AIPAC on Sunday. 
And then uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu will speak to a joint session of the Congress on, I believe, Monday. As a result of all this, there may be a short uptick in U.S.-Israeli tensions, but that may end up uh, helping Palestinians to decide to shelve the idea of unilateral uh, declaration of independence, something that President Abbas explained in an op-ed this week in the New York Times, and to uh, decide to return to the negotiating table. And if that's the case, then this gambit by the president will have proved to be uh, very successful. Uh, that's my formal remarks. Um, I'm looking over to see if she wants to add a few things. Catherine Hughes, who's also a member of the board of AUC, and many of you know her, a longtime resident of Princeton and a wonderful person, might have a few things to add because we spent the week uh, together in Cairo. Thank you. Um, there quick Can you hear me quick and impressionistic? Um, I think that you, yeah, Kate, use the mic. Yeah. Uh, the main thing to say is that there are no stupid questions to be asked. Uh, and I think that's because of the fluidity of the situation. For example, um, it was said repeatedly, there are no police. Uh, that that's one of, was one of the major complaints. And you would think, well, maybe it's a little dumb to ask, well, where are they? And then somebody would ask, where are they? And the answer was, nobody knew. Well, who might have given them the, the instructions to go to one place or another? Nobody knew that either. Uh, I, I found that striking, and it speaks to the kind of inchoate quality that contributed to a feeling, I, I, I feel this quite strongly, of rather pervasive unease and maybe even fear. I felt that much more strongly among older people, by which I mean over 25, than <laughs> younger people. Um, at, there was also a very, um, active sense of people of all ages trying to make sense of things. And I think that speaks to Ambassador Kurtzer's um, town hall quality that's going, everybody is engaged. Um, but I sensed really deep and um, in ways specific pessimism among older <coughs> people. Um, just having to do with the um, pervasiveness of the unknowns. And I would also cite sadness. I, I really did have a pretty bleak I came home with a pretty bleak impression of things, except for the, except for the euphoria, which hasn't gone away among the students. Um, and they, I think that, if to generalize, they believe that, they almost believe that their feeling of hope can somehow sustain this and carry the process through. Um, and just one last note about sadness. I was in the souk, where, uh, which is normally mobbed. There was almost nobody there, and where normally one would haggle. And uh, you know, obviously, I wasn't going to haggle with uh, over a robe or something. But not only could you not haggle, the uh, merchants were offering you things free. They said, "Don't leave. I'll give it to you." All right, I'd be happy to take questions, comments. I, maybe just approach the microphone, yeah. You sort of alluded to it at the end, but there are a number of rumblings from Egypt in the foreign policy areas, such as uh, an approach to Iran. Uh, the president was unhappy with Hamas and Fatah getting together, but it was under the auspices of the new Egypt. Uh, the opening of the Gaza border and bottom I wonder if you can say a few things about the foreign policy of Egypt as enunciated recently and the strategic interests of the United States. The, um, what was interesting is that the foreign minister, who uh, about two hours after I met him was elected the Secretary General of the Arab League, so it was kind of a little odd having just met with him and then he's out of a job, um, basically said that there has been a very inflated uh, set of concerns about things that Egypt is trying to do. And he kind of went down the list. He said, look, with Iran, everybody in the Middle East has an Iranian embassy in their capital and has an ambassador in Tehran, except for Egypt. So when Egypt said that it's going to restore an embassy in Tehran and host an, embassy, an Iranian embassy in Cairo, everybody got nervous, but he said, all we're doing is bringing our level of diplomatic engagement up to where everybody else is with no intention of going beyond it. Uh, he also recounted, uh, I'll, I'll spare you which country, uh, 
that uh, he was at a meeting recently and one of the Arab heads of state who's nervous about Iran uh, started to uh, rake him over the coals and he said, excuse me, but you have an Iranian ambassador and embassy in your country and the head of state turned to his foreign minister and said, we do? <laughs> so um, the explanation on Iran was, uh, don't get too nervous. We're, we're just uh, regularizing a relationship which uh, we, Egypt, have no intention to uh, enhance. And I, I have to tell you, he made a credible case. Uh, there still is a very significant residual concern in Egypt about Iran, so uh, it's unlikely that uh, the opening of this different chapter uh, you know, portends some major expansion of relations. Um, on the issue of Palestinian reconciliation, the Egyptians <clears throat> have been pressing this for years, since uh, 2007. Uh, they were upset, A, that they didn't broker the Mecca agreement, and that the Mecca agreement didn't work. So they've been trying ever since to be both the broker and the successful broker of reconciliation. And it stems from a strongly held view in Egypt that if you want a successful peace process, it cannot happen with half of the Palestinian people. In other words, only those in the West Bank. Uh, as harder as it's going to be if you bring in Hamas uh, and, and Gaza, uh, it's required. And so you might as well do the hard work in the process rather than uh, have a process that's likely to fail because you've left them out. And this is a debatable point. The president today made clear that he's on the other side of that argument, doesn't like Hamas at all, uh, understands why Israel would not, and we would support uh, Israel's not negotiating with a party that doesn't recognize it and says that it will never recognize it and has not renounced terrorism. Um, so there is a difference of view between the United States and Egypt on this issue. But this is not new in the revolution. What's new in the revolution is that the Egyptians succeeded in bringing about reconciliation. And one can make the argument, um, at least academically, that uh, the success of reconciliation now stemmed from two factors. Number one is Hamas's weakness. Hamas's big patron, of course, is both Syria and Iran. And Hamas is under some pressure in Syria. There were rumors and uh, reports weeks ago that Hamas was looking to move its headquarters from Damascus because it was uncertain not just about stability in Damascus, but whether or not the regime was going to test Hamas to support the regime against the people. And the Palestinians don't want to get involved you know, as a factor, sorry, as a factor in between the Syrian regime and the people. And the second issue, of course, uh, not just uh, Hamas's weakness can be argued to be a factor here, but also the fact that there isn't a peace process. And so uh, as Abbas, the president of the PA has said, uh, you know, I, what's the alternative here? The alternative is unity so that we can develop an, develop an approach that in a sense takes the place of a peace process that's not working. I don't justify it, but that's the argument that the Egyptians make. So uh, it, uh, the bottom line from my conversations, and again, these are snapshot conversations, but the bottom line is I don't think the Egyptians are heading off in any dangerous or different direction with regard to uh, their foreign relations that will create a problem for us. <clears throat> we have always had a difference of view on some of these issues that may be a little sharper. Um, some of these issues may get exacerbated by events on the ground, but uh, you get a strong feeling among the elites post-revolution that they don't want to see the U.S. relationship uh, or even the relationship with Israel change fundamentally. So you're not left with the sign of revolutionary change in those areas. Yeah, Will. Uh, Ambassador, I wanted to ask you a little more about the Egyptian military, and in particular, as you know, the Egyptian military has a vast array of economic holdings um, that have still largely escaped popular scrutiny in Egypt, I think, and I mean in part because the media can't really cover that still. But how much of uh, the, you know, how much of that is playing into the military's calculations? How careful are they, you know, how much are they being driven by concerns over their sources of wealth versus, you know, the, the role that's often ascribed to them as sort of protecting the revolution? 
Um, and how well are they also able to maintain internal discipline at this point? I mean, military conscription was never a popular program among Egyptian youth when I was there, and uh, I'm curious how well they're able to really uh, enforce orders down the ranks. Yeah, both questions are right on the mark. On the, on the first question, um, as you said, we don't know. Uh, so the easy answer is that I don't know. Um, I can conjecture that part of the reasoning of the military to want to get back to the barracks fast is they don't want to come under the scrutiny of uh, this increasingly interested public about their economic activities. And um, they also don't want to come under the scrutiny of the prosecutor general, who would probably not put them under scrutiny, but they don't want to test it. That's conjecture. We don't know that. Uh, but it's a widely perceived view that the military um, is doing what it can to fence off its economic role so that it simply remains opaque and uh, outside the scope of, uh, of public uh, debate. On the second question, uh, there is evidence, uh, all anecdotal and all coming from individuals who may or may not have access, that there are differences of view within the military on virtually all of the issues that we discussed today. <clears throat> that there are some within even the higher uh, councils of the military who are not averse to having the military stay in power or uh, govern not from behind the throne, but maybe alongside the throne. Um, there's also a view which ties in with the first question that uh, suggests that one of the reasons why the military may want to be a little more overt in its governance is to make sure that the next government of Egypt doesn't tamper with military perks and military economy. Uh, but again, this is all conjecture. Uh, nobody quite knows. Um, there is not yet any evidence to suggest that the military's um, standing within society has eroded. You hear some from among the youth movement who are expressing some concern that the military may get too comfortable uh, governing. And you know maybe we just substituted the military for Mubarak, but it's not yet, um, it hasn't snowballed. Well, nothing snowballs in Cairo, so I, I'll find some other word to use. It hasn't grown, um, uh, and, and, and therefore it's, uh, it's a very early indication of some concern, but I don't think it's, it's going to grow very much. Thank you, Ambassador. I'd like to ask about U.S.-Egyptian military relations. My impression is that early in the last decade, uh, U.S.-Egyptian military relations were extremely important. And I'd like to know what, what you see as the future of uh, these relations uh, in the short to medium term, and how important Egypt, Egypt remains um, to, the, to the U.S. military. Thank you. Well, I indicated in a, a lecture some time ago that uh, one of the the successes, and I, I say it's a success because we articulated a certain set of policies in the late 1970s, and then they actually happened. So if that's what you want to accomplish, and you accomplish it, it's a success. Uh, the U.S.-Egyptian military relationship, by that definition, is a success. We wanted to uh, wean the Egyptian military off of Soviet uh, doctrine, weapons, and training, and to substitute our own doctrine, weapons, and training, and we did so and it proved itself out in the first Gulf War when the Egyptians sent two divisions <clears throat> to fight alongside of us uh, in pushing Iraq out of Kuwait. Uh, our military to military activities since then have intensified the relationship. Uh, Egypt as part of our assistance uh, has assembled uh, M1A1 tanks and other kinds of equipment. They've tried to assimilate more advanced American weaponry into their arsenal. Um, but, uh, uh, and, th and there's no change, uh, at least today, in any of that uh, whole complex of relations between our two countries. <clears throat> one, you know, uh, in this case, I think one would be on fairly safe ground to suggest that, uh, as the president said today, you remember in his speech, one of the first things he did was to uh, reaffirm, I think there were six core principles of American intro, six interests that the, the United States follows in the region. Uh, I think he was basically signaling that this is one of those relationships that's going to be very valuable to us uh, 
in this period of very intense change. Now, having said that, you know, it's hard to project that we'd actually do anything collaboratively with the Egyptian military in the period ahead. But if the military retains its status as a kind of the corporate identity of the Egyptian nation uh, and uh, therefore uh, needs to be fed with you know, current weaponry and, and uh, training, then I would assume that our relationship would, uh, would continue. I see no reason for it to change. Thanks, Ambassador. Um, in the annual program statement that USAID put out in March, um, it says USAID will distribute $65 million next year um, for a whole bunch of reforms. Most of the examples that USAID gave, though, were about um, helping civil society organizations. About? Uh, helping civil society organizations. Um, as you've said in, in your speech, there's a real problem with law enforcement in Egypt and governance capacity. Um, the Egyptian security apparatus is well practiced in fingernail pulling, but not really in, in dusting for fingerprints. Um, so my question is, what role um, should or might USAID and other international donors play in um, helping improve governance capacity? I know that in the past there might have been um, some hesitance to, to do that because um, helping the police do a better job of being police under an authoritarian system of rule might help improve justice in some regards, but could also make authoritarianism more efficient. Um, is this the proper juncture to, to change that policy? Yeah, it's a really interesting question because of a lot of reasons, but um, in one respect, because of one line in the president's speech today, <clears throat> where he said that uh, the United States will continue to support uh, civil society and NGOs, even if they don't uh, uh, have the favor of the regime. Uh, and this is interesting because in Egypt, as in many other countries, this has been a major bone of contention between the United States, between AID and the host government. The host governments want us to only support NGOs that are registered. And I heard this in Cairo in one of my meetings, a complaint about AID that it is funding NGOs that are not registered. And the president of all things in this major policy speech actually, I never told him about my conversations, but basically answered the people in Cairo who said, please stop funding them, because he said, we're gonna keep funding them. So there will be some tension in the period ahead because I think the United <coughs> States sees as part of this commitment that the president articulated to support change that these organizations need to get um, the funding and the uh, support that allows them to, to continue their operations even if they're not that popular with the regime in power. Um, and I, I, my guess is that the AID, in this case Egyptian dialogue, is going to be pretty scratchy on this issue in the period ahead because AID now has a presidential mandate. You know, they've been told specifically this is what I want you to do. And they are going to hear in Cairo, as they probably have already heard, we do not want you to fund uh, civil society that we don't approve. Uh, so I think it's going to be a major bone of contention in the, inter, uh, in the dialogue between our two countries. Yeah. yeah um, <clears throat> what do you make of our overarching regional policy, especially with regard to the Libyan adventure? And it's, um, is there any correlation between that and what we're trying to accomplish in Egypt? Well, this is probably a subject of an entire session of its own, and to be fair, uh, we probably have to bring Dean Slaughter in here, because I think she and I have different, quite different views on this issue. Uh, the argument for what the international community is doing in Libya uh, is basically carrying out uh, a humanitarian mission uh, under the rubric of the responsibility to protect. This is a new, or it's not a new concept, but it's a concept that is newly being implemented in international law. And in some respects, this may be the first serious test case of how you carry out this principle. Uh, the problem with it is uh, how well or poorly defined the mission has been in Libya. Uh, has the international intervention actually prolonged the uh, warfare in Libya and therefore the suffering of the people? 
uh, has it accomplished its purpose by uh, giving uh, space to the rebels to continue their activity? These are very serious questions, uh, which in the run-up to the intervention itself, um, there was some debate, but probably not enough to think through some of the implications. And what nobody looked at was, what do you do in the next case, which could be Syria as the poster child for the next issue? What number of civilian casualties inflicted by the regime makes you kick in with a humanitarian intervention? Is it 50? Is it 100? Is it 500? Human rights organizations are suggesting that, I don't know, it's upwards of 700 people in Syria may have been killed. Maybe the number's higher. Does that trigger uh, a move by the Security Council to consider military intervention? <clears throat> and what happens if the numbers start to rise, not just in the Middle East, but in Sierra Leone or in the Great Lakes area of Africa and elsewhere? So um, Libya is both an interesting test case of this principle of international law, but it's a test case which has a lot of potential uh, dangers and traps that have not yet been navigated. And uh, the president, uh, at least today, at least kind of went down the list of countries of concern. I mean, one of the issues in the region was would he avoid talking about the problem areas, but he didn't. He mentioned Bahrain, he mentioned Yemen, mentioned Saleh by name, mentioned uh, Syria. Uh, but then what you do about it and how that derives or doesn't derive from what we're doing in Libya are huge unanswered questions at this time. Thank you, Ambassador. I was wondering if you could comment on who you think is in a good position to benefit if uh, stability is not restored and the economy continues to founder. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, at some point, if stability really, really collapsed, uh, I would expect that the military would intervene much more dramatically and frontally to restore stability, including uh, a longer term uh, effort to, to rule. In other words, if the system doesn't quite produce the beginning of a democratic transformation, and I, I say beginning, because this is really long, you know, many years, then um, I think the military would, at the expense of democracy, uh, favor stability. In the short term, uh, you know, who, who knows who benefits from instability? If there is a counter-revolution at some point, well, it's obviously the counter-revolutionaries who benefit from it, but for how long and under what circumstances will that help their, their uh, case over the long term? Um, I think there's a sense in some quarters in this country that the Islamists would benefit from it, but um, in fact I'm not so sure. Uh, because there's a concern in Egypt that the Islamists will benefit from it, if there's instability, they'll be blamed for it. And I'm not sure that will, that will help their cause. The Islamists have been on, the Muslim brother in particular, has been on very good behavior until now. Um, and we also know there was a talk here some weeks ago by Monty Steinberg, a visiting professor, that reminded us that there is a major split within the Muslim Brotherhood between uh, the younger generation and the older generation. And the younger generation, you see pictures now of Muslim brothers and cops and women and all kinds of people that normally would not get together getting together because there is this generational split. So it's a, it's a good question, but you know, who knows who benefits from instability? The, one, the reason I started with the, what the military would do is that I don't think that their attention span is too long with respect to instability. Um, they, they do not want to see chaos uh, overtake the country. Yes, sir. The Muslim Brotherhood is probably the most organized group in Egypt at this point. How do you think that's going to play out in the post-revolution in terms of their dominating uh, and taking control, just as the Bolsheviks took control in Russia? Yeah, it's generally assumed to be the case that they're the most organized because they lived underground for so many years that they had to be organized in order to avoid uh, you know, regime retribution and, and interference. Um, the only way we're going to know if that's true is as a result of the elections coming up when people actually vote. Um, 
among the political calculators in Egypt right now is one that we're very familiar with. What will the size of the turnout mean on the election results? And there, there's a view that I heard quite widely that if there is a large turnout, the Brotherhood will not do that well. They will do very well if there's a small turnout because they can get their supporters to the polling stations and they can get their supporters to vote. So in one respect, you know, we were talking earlier about U.S. activities. One of the things that we can be helpful is um, kind of voter registration. They're now using identity cards, but uh, that may change when the electoral law is finally uh, passed or, or issued. And then figuring out a way to help the Egyptians work through uh, polling problems so that more people can get to the polls and vote. And that, you know, then we'll, then we'll know whether the theory is right. But that's something that a lot of people are now looking at, which is get a lot of people to vote, and that will mitigate the effect of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood's organizational uh, benefits. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for speaking with us, Ambassador. My question is just um, about the role of the youth going forward, especially given the role that they played in starting the revolution, and especially sort of the AUC young, rich crowd that's sort of um, pretty excited about what's occurred. Um, also, just uh, mentioning the Muslim Brotherhood and how there's the split between the younger and the older, if you could talk about whether you think that split will play into the uh, whatever youth movement going forward and sort of their organization or disorganization. Yeah, it's a good question because nobody knows. Um, the, uh, their, the, the, the youth um, don't speak with one voice. And right now there's registration of party after party after party which are you know, representing both personality differences as well as you know, nuanced political differences. There is apparently a coalition of the revolution's youth, which is trying to uh, act as an umbrella uh, to bring as many of these youth groups, youth organizations under their wings. There's also a lot of young people, even in the AUC crowd, that wants the revolution to continue but doesn't want to run for office. You know, they're happy filming and uh, working and teaching whatever else they were doing. So it's very hard to get a, a grip on, on what this will mean in generational terms. <clears throat> As noted earlier, in terms of the organizational capabilities of different groups, these uh, emerging youth groups are at a huge disadvantage because uh, they don't have money and they don't have organization and um, they're doing this for the first time. The one advantage they have is that they can ask questions all over the world because they know how to use the Facebooks and the Twitters and the social networks in ways that uh, you know the old established po uh, politicians in Egypt don't have a clue. So this will also be an interesting test case of whether or not there is a, a kind of global benefit in domestic terms of being able to mobilize ideas, resources, support uh, internationally for in a situation like this. Um, we, uh, we almost attracted to Princeton for next year someone who now may be running for president in Egypt. He in fact let us know during the uprising that he thought he would stay in Egypt because it was a once in a lifetime chance to run a revolution. And you know, how can you say no to that? But, um, you know, this may be a successful young person, you know, I think he's in his mid-30s, maybe late 30s, so, you know, there's all kinds of folks out there now, um, but there's also all kind of, I don't want to call us older folks, but, you know, there's still politicians uh, in the cabinet who uh, um, were not associated with the old regime and uh, who want to hang around and now actually run the government, so it's going to be interesting to watch. Thank you very much.